take your seats, please? And we'll begin our time together. Are we streaming here? Are you guys on? Oh, you check. Oh, I'm sure you are. Well, to the rest of you, good evening. Welcome. Good to see you again. Good to be with you. Nice to have a couple of newcomers in the back there. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Newcomers and members at the same time. So that's great. Nice to have you guys with us, the Johnsons. Friends, maybe just uh, one or two announcements before we get going. Okay there, everyone? All right, I'll keep going. You guys keep bringing it out. Uh, one, one really important announcement that we've, we just kind of want to think this through with you guys. Um, next Sunday night, this service will start at 6 p.m., not 6.30 Alright, so if you rock up at 6.30, you're going to miss half the service. So 6 p.m. next Sunday night, we're just going to hopefully try and bounce a little earlier and make it a little easier for those who keep missing both services because the, the morning service is too full uh, and they don't want to come in the evening because it's a little too late. So let's try and figure out maybe a middle ground there. 6 p.m. next Sunday night, God willing, we'll be together again, okay? The second notice that I have is that we're going to be in Lamentations tonight, in Lamentations chapter 5, which is the last chapter in Lamentations, um, but this won't be the last sermon in Lamentations, okay? So don't get your hopes, you know, don't set your hopes too high here. We're going to come to the end of the book here, but we're going to go back and maybe just stop from the beginning again, because, because we can, that'll be fun. So let's go, to, let's go to Lamentations 5 together. I'll pray for us. And then we'll get into this, into this passage together. Let's bow together. Our Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. We come before you because of Jesus' righteousness. We have no righteousness of our own. We cannot earn a spot in your presence. We cannot come to your throne on our own merit. And yet you've said that your throne is a throne of grace. We come because of what your Son has done for us. And so we glory in the Savior tonight. Thank you that we can come to you and call you Father because of what Jesus has done. And we recognize you are our Father. And because you are our Father, we know that you care. We know that you love us. We know there hasn't been a second outside of eternity or in eternity when you haven't loved us. Your word tells us you've loved us from before the foundation of the world. So we recognize that tonight. And we celebrate that tonight. That you love us, that you're our Father, and that you care. And the psalmist says that you have kept count of all of our fears and tremblings and tossings. You put our tears in your bottle. You keep record of our tears. We thank you for that tonight. Thank you that our suffering is not pointless. But you see it. You know it. You have in so many ways designed it and brought it. And so we recognize all these things. And because you are our Father, we know this is for our good. And so I pray, help us to learn that tonight as we come to this passage. Teach us about yourself. Teach us again that our suffering is not pointless. Teach us that you are a Father who loves us and cares for us. Who remembers us. Who keeps our tears in the bottle. Show us yourself within your word tonight, I pray. Show us ourselves. Show us our Savior, and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This week, our neighbor's house was broken into. And I imagine if that happened to you, some of you have experienced that. Uh, it's, it's awful. Imagine your house has been broken into, and it's, it's three hours later, and you... you you have a friend who comes to visit you. And 
you take your friend and, and you know what's the first thing you do when your friend shows up at the door perhaps perhaps you start to cry perhaps you share uh, you share a hug and then you you take your friend with you and you walk through your house don't you and, and you and you start to to show your friend how it all happened this is this is the window where they came in this is this is the room that they emptied out look at all those drawers i used to keep my jewelry in those drawers look at look at our cupboard this has been emptied out and then they came down the passage and then they, they came into this bedroom and they emptied out our safe and, and, and you, you you walk through all of that with with your friend now here's the question why why are you telling your friend that or if, if you'll allow me maybe just to change to change the analogy imagine your house burns down and you couldn't save anything the whole thing just just gone and two days later you you're back in the house and you're walking through this place again for maybe the tenth time and, and, and the friend comes to visit again and you you take that friend with you what do you say to your friend well you say to your friend you, you say look here here's where the fire started right here and then you explain to your friend how the fire spread. It, 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 it kind of rose up the wall and caught, a, caught that cupboard and then it lit the ceiling and then the curtains caught on fire. And then pretty soon the whole house was, was in flame. Look at our, look at our couch. We, we used to have a dining room table right here. It's all gone now. It's just ashes. Look, look, at, look at my cupboard. That's where all my clothes were. All of them burnt. Now, what are you doing as you walk your friend through your house? I mean, your friend can see the damage. Your friend can see the devastation. What are you doing as you walk your friend through? Well, this is what you're doing. You're sharing your grief. You're asking your friend to enter into your pain. If I can, if I can take it up just one notch. Imagine your house burns down because you were careless. I mean, you, you know, you left the stove on and something caught fire and now the whole house is gone. Woof, up in smoke, okay? What do you say when you walk through the house with your friend? Maybe as you walk through, you're going to slip in a couple of these. You're going to slip in this sentence. I'm such a fool. I can't believe I was so careless. Look, look at, look at my son's bedroom, all of it gone. I can't believe I was so silly. And so there's this added little note here. It's not just a description of how terrible it is. There's an added explanation of why it is this bad. There's this added note of confession. This is all my fault. Now, can I be so bold as to say... The biggest problem is not that your house burned down. The biggest problem is that you were so stupid. You, you may learn to live without that house. You might learn to live on without all of those possessions. But you may not be able to live with you and your stupidity. There's grief involved in that, and that is what will eat you up. Now, here's, here's how I think we need to understand Lamentations 5, especially verse 1 through verse 18. I think Jeremiah is walking through the house after the house has been burgled. He's walking through the house after the house has burned down. And he's talking about the devastation. Now, We've, we've got the book of Lamentations down by now. Surely, surely, surely. He did this in chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3 and chapter 4. He just told us how devastating it is. Look at the carnage. Look at the damage. But now in chapter 5, he's not telling us the story. The audience changes in chapter 5. In chapter 5, he's talking to God. Chapter 5 is the longest prayer in Lamentations. There's been short prayers through Lamentations 1 and 2 and 3. No prayers in chapter 4. But now chapter 5 is one long prayer. And so he's speaking to God now. He's showing God the devastation. 
Look, Lord, this is where the fire started. And then, Lord, what happened was it rose up the curtain and the ceiling caught fire and then the whole house burned down. And look, Lord, all of my stuff is gone. And we're going to hear him give the detailed description and then he's going to tuck away a little confession in there. He's going to slip it in there. And Lord, this is all our fault. We've sinned. It's because of our stupidity. He's going to slip that in there as well. And so friends, in that moment, when Jeremiah does that, he puts his finger on the biggest problem. Perhaps they can live without a city. Perhaps they can live without city walls. Perhaps they can live without a temple. But they have to live with themselves. They have to live with the sin that's inside of them. And that sin that's inside of them has pushed God away. Jeremiah puts his finger here on the biggest problem. That's always the biggest problem. It's always your biggest problem. You can learn to live without your possessions. You can learn to live with a dread disease. You can learn to live with the loss of a spouse. You can learn to live with the grief of miscarriage. All of those horrible things. Those are circumstances that you will face, that I will face. But those trials, those circumstances are not your biggest problem, friends. Your biggest problem is the sin that lives inside of you. That's the problem behind the problem. And I think that that's what gets addressed in this chapter. So the chapter ends with a prayer, Lord, only you can fix this. They recognize the problem behind the problem. And so, before we read, the title then is going to be Restore Us. I want you to look out for these three prayers as we go through this chapter. Look out for the first prayer, Lord, remember. The second prayer, Lord, you reign. And the third prayer, Lord, restore. I'll read Lamentations 1, Lamentations 5, verse 1. You follow along. I'm going to offer some comment as we go through, just for the sake of, of fleshing out Look, Lord, that's where it started. Look, Lord, there's my bedroom that got burned. I'll just, I'll, just try and, I'll just try and offer some comment through the first 18 verses. Verse 1. Remember, O Lord, what has happened to us. Look and see our disgrace. Our inheritance has been turned over to aliens. Our homes to foreigners. They've been invaded. Their homes, their country, overrun by a foreign nation. Verse 3. We have become orphans and fatherless. Our mothers, like widows, they're abandoned. Abandoned. The nation is alone, like an orphaned child. Verse 4. We must buy the water we drink. Our wood can be had only at a price. They are economically depressed. Basic necessities come now at a high cost. Can you you hear them saying, the things that we should have had for free, now we've got to pay for them. The water that I drink, the wood that warms my home, now comes at a price. That's what they're saying. I never had to pay for these before, but now, oh, but now all of my... All of my actions have brought this. My sin has consequences. My sin is costly. That's what he's saying. Verse 5. Those who pursue us are at our heels. We are weary and we find no rest. The constant gnawing of the enemy has left them stressed out. No rest. Verse 6. We submitted to Egypt and Assyria to get enough bread. The plan to rely on other nations flopped on them. We saw that last week. Verse 7. Our fathers sinned and are no more. And we bear their punishment. Verse 8. Slaves rule over us. And there is none to free us from their hands. The whole society is flipped on its head. Slaves rule over them. Verse 9, we get our bread at the risk of our lives. 
because of the sword in the desert, just to get bread, just to survive, comes at the threat of their very lives. Verse 10, our skin is hot as an oven, feverish from hunger. We saw last week the effects of famine, starvation. Hunger and dehydration take a toll on a body. Fever, sickness, death. Verse 11, women have been ravished, uh, ravished in Zion and virgins in the town of Judah. They've been assaulted. That's what happens when a city is under siege and is taken over by an enemy. They come in and kill men and rape women. And that's what's happened, verse 11. Verse 12, princes have been hung up by their hands. Elders are shown no respect. Verse 13, young men toil at the millstones. Boys stagger under loads of wood. Toiling at a millstone was the job of an animal. They've been forced to work like that. Verse 14, verse 15. The elders are gone from the city gate. The young men have stopped their music. Joy is gone from our hearts. Our dancing has turned to mourning. The music's gone. There is no reason to rejoice anymore. Verse 16, the crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us. For we have sinned. He just, he just slips it in there. He just slips it in there. They once had the prominent position, the crown. God's people. Well, now the crown is gone because of their sin. Verse 17, because of this, our hearts are faint. Because of these things, our eyes grow dim. Verse 18, for Mount Zion, which lies desolate with jackals prowling over it. We spoke about jackals last week. The nation is destroyed and wild animals invade. Jackals would come and scavenge dead bodies. Verse 19, you, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation why do you always forget us? Why do you forsake us so long? Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may return. Renew our days as of old. Unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. The word of the Lord. Three prayers. I trust you saw them. Remember. You reign and restore the R's. Kids think of a pirate, said one, one commentator, the R's. Number one, Lord, remember. Lord, remember. Can you see how he takes God by the hand and walks God through the house? Look, Lord, look. That's where it started. And then it spread, God. And then it got worse. He, he walks God through the house. Verse 2, foreign invaders have destroyed the nation. Look, God. They feel abandoned, verse 3. Survival is hard, verse 4. God, we can't even survive here. They're exhausted, verse 5. Foreign nations have failed them even though they appealed to them, verse 6. They are bearing the consequences of their sin, verse 7. Desperation and hunger, verse 9, verse 10. Women are raped, verse 11. Look, God, look. Look, Lord. That's what he's saying. Hopelessness has settled in, verse 17. There's no more music, verse 14, verse 15. Animals roam the streets. Look at them, God. Look at them. That's what he's saying. Now, why? Why does he go over all of this again? We've had four chapters of this already. Why again? Well, I think there's a clue in verse 3. Look again at verse 3. Specifically, he mentions this. We have become orphans 
and fatherless, our mothers like widows. Why mention widows and the fatherless specifically? Well, they do this, friends. Surely there's only one reason. They know they do this because they know that God has a soft spot for orphans, widows. Deuteronomy 10, verse 17 and 18. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. God will fight for the fatherless and the widow. God has a soft spot for them. And so here... Zion compares herself to a widow and an orphan. God, we're like an orphan right now. Why do you think he does that? Well, I think he's, he's saying, God, I want you to enter into our pain here. God, enter into our pain. He wants to bring up the misery again because he knows God cares. And this is what the whole book of Lamentations is about. The book of Lamentations, friends, is a gift to us from God the Holy Spirit. He's giving you language to use to say to God in your suffering, God, look, God, this is how I feel. He wants you to express your grief. Friends, have you ever done that? Do you do that in your suffering, in your grief? Look, Lord, look, it happened again today, God. This is where it started. I don't know what your marriages are like. My marriages is a very strange dynamic of this. We I'll be home all alone by myself most of the time. That's where we work now, we work from home. And my family will come home, my wife will come home and say, let me tell you the kind of day that I had. And she'll just offload. You know, she'll talk for 25 minutes, she'll talk for 40 minutes. Just let me tell you about, you know, this kid or this colleague, you know, she'll just, if I can use the word vent. I mean, I'm not going to go to the school and beat somebody up. What am I going to do? I'm just a guy, you know, what do I know? But she just needed to vent. Do you vent to God? Do you say, God, it happened again? God, that's where it started. Sometimes you just need to vent. And so this verse 1 through verse 18 is just a cataloging of pain. And he puts it all down on paper. He catalogs the pain as a setup for the first prayer in verse 1. So that he can say to God, God, remember. Remember. It sets up that word, remember. Let this this text help you talk to God about your pain. And then let this text show you what you're supposed to do after that. Something, Something enormously comforting here for us. To know that God remembers. God knows. But you can't tell God to remember. I mean, hold on a second. They're going through this. Because of their sin. I mean, they did this to themselves, didn't they? I mean, you can't, you can't disobey God and then have God punish you and then go back to God and say, Hey, God, I'm suffering. I mean, of course you're suffering. God's the one who did that to you. You can't go to God with that, can you? Well, interestingly enough, they do. Isn't that fascinating? Doesn't this tell you something about your heavenly father? That although he's the one who disciplines you, he's still the one who's going to make it better. It's fascinating. There must mean that there's something, there's something beneath this relationship here. It's not just that God spanked them and left them. Now Jeremiah recognizes that God cared enough To discipline them, which means he cares about us, even after he's disciplined us. He cares about us, therefore he disciplined us. He must, must, must love us. And so he can say, remember, O Lord, 
Look, O oh Lord. Does this say anything to parents in our day? About the way we discipline our kids? As an expression of our love? Maybe that's another sermon for another day. But this first prayer, remember, O oh Lord. That word remember, friends, in your Old Testament is a very important word in terms of the covenant relationship and dynamic that God had with his people. Remembering was a massive thing for these people. You get a sense that, that this remembering is so much more than, oh, God had forgotten and now he's remembered. That's how you and I remember, not the way it works with God. It's not like he forgot it and then he brought it to mind. I'll show you uh, in uh, Genesis 8, for example. Genesis 8, do you remember this? This is when Noah is in the ark with his family. It says, but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. 150 days in the ark. It's not like God said, oh, tch, Noah, his family, totally forgot about you guys. My bad. Sorry, I remember. That's not what it means. When he remembered Noah, it, it caused God to act, to do something. He sent wind and the water subsided. Or chapter 9. Uh, Genesis chapter 9. I will remember my covenant that is between me and you. When the bow is in the clouds. That's the rainbow. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant. To remember is not only to call or to think of something. It's a call to action. Let me give you another one in your Old Testament. This is um, Exodus 20. You remember this one? This is the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Starts off with the word remember. Because remembering leads to some kind of action. Remember is a call to action. And again, all the way through your Old Testament, I'm bringing this up because Jeremiah would have known these passages. Exodus chapter 2. You know the context. The people are in Egypt. Exodus chapter 2. During those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob and God saw the people of Israel and God knew. So what does God do? That leads God into some kind of action. Exodus chapter 3, you know this passage I hope. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. It causes God to call Moses to himself and use Moses as his tool to rescue his people. Do you get the sense behind the word remember? It's an appeal for God to give grace. Remember, Lord, they're saying, God, give grace. And give grace, Lord, based on your track record, your faithfulness. Give grace, Lord, not because we've been faithful. Give grace because you are faithful to yourself. God remembered his covenant. He's made a promise. And so God acts. Friends, we must pray, God, remember. We must pray, God, remember me. We must pray, God, hear my pain. We do this, and God listens, and He enters into our pain. That's, that's why you tell your friend, that's where it started. So they enter into your pain. That's the first prayer is, Lord, remember. The second prayer is, Lord, you reign. Look at it there in verse 19 verse 19 you O lord reign forever your throne endures from generation to generation 
In verse 19, Jeremiah is recalling truth. Kind of like what he did in chapter 3 on the beach in Beirut. He's recalling truth. He's affirming what he knows to be true about God. We live through suffering by what we believe, not by what we see and feel. I'll say that again. We live through suffering by what we believe, not by what we see and feel. Jeremiah is stating truth. You reign. We've covered this ground already in the study of Lamentations. But let, me, let me come at this from a different angle, if I may. If God reigns, if God is sovereign over the universe, then suffering has a purpose. Suffering has a purpose. If you don't know that God is sovereign in your suffering, well, then you'll be tempted to think that your suffering is pointless. It's theology that gets you through suffering. I know that God is sovereign, so my suffering is not pointless. God, who is a master surgeon, will use suffering as his tool to show you what you believe. What you really believe. You'll find out what you believe when you go through suffering. You'll find out what you believe about God when you go through suffering. You'll find out what you believe about yourself when you go through suffering. You'll find out what you believe about this world when you go through suffering. It breaks down, I think, into these two options. You suffer either for no reason at all, or you suffer for a reason. Those are your options, really. If you suffer for no reason at all, God has completely lost the plot and God is not sovereign. If you suffer for a reason, well then God must be teaching you something. That's the reason. That's why you're suffering. Now this verse, verse 19, gives us the truth. There it is. You, O Lord, reign forever. God is sovereign. Therefore, listen, all suffering has a reason. Or else God's lost the plot. Now we want to seek God's help in learning what that reason is. You can either... Pay attention in your suffering and learn what the reason is. Or you can waste your suffering and have no learning at all. Friends, that should change your perspective on suffering. It will change the way that you pray when you go through suffering. I had a conversation with a young lady at Life Beacon Bay Hospital. She was in this hospital bed... Again, and she had a, a dreadful pregnancy. Uh, she'd been hospitalized, you know, time and time again through this, through this pregnancy. And basically she'd been told here, you're not allowed to leave this hospital until your baby is born. She had to spend the next five weeks in bed in hospital. So I go visit her. I asked the question, what have you learned about God in this? And then what have you learned about yourself in this? Two questions, hopefully easy questions. She said, I haven't really thought about that. I thought, you've spent so much time in hospital, on your back, suffering, and you hadn't thought about that. Friends, if God has brought suffering into your life, He's done that for a reason. Surely we ought to use the suffering as a time of learning. So let me ask the question, how do you pray when you go through suffering? If God has deliberately brought the hardship into your life, the only thing you can pray then, maybe not the only thing, but one of the things you should pray is, God help me to learn. Now, I know that's not the first thing we pray. The first thing we pray is, God, please take it away. 
God, please take it away. Take the hardship away. But friends, if that's the only thing you ever pray, then you've missed the point. You've missed the point of suffering. It would be like my son, if you can imagine this. My son who goes to school and arrives at 7 o'clock in the morning. And he walks into his classroom and greets his teacher. Good morning, ma'am. Please, can the school day be over? Good morning, Ezra. School just started. Yes, ma'am, but please, can the day be over? And she gets through the first lesson. He comes over and says, ma'am, please, can the day be over? But Ezra, we've only had one lesson. Yes, but ma'am, please, can it just be over? She teaches the second lesson. He comes up after the second lesson and says, Ma'am, please, can the day just be over? Imagine if every day, before and after every lesson at school, this kid begs his teacher, please make it stop. Make it stop. He wouldn't learn anything. He would hate school. More and more, every time that he got dropped off at the gate, he would hate that. And his parents would be thinking, what are we sending this kid there for, wasting our money? His teachers are saying, what am I teaching this kid for? He doesn't even want to be here. He doesn't even want to learn. How do you respond when you walk through suffering? God, please make it stop. If God is sovereign, your suffering is never never pointless to quote one author suffering is hard but suffering is not bad pray that god would not let you waste your suffering pray that pray that god would grow you through your suffering and it's yes it's not wrong to pray god please take it away it's not wrong to pray that but if that's the only thing you pray Friend, you're like the eight-year-old who's saying, Ma'am, can it be over, please? Well, the day hasn't even started yet. Friend, I don't know why God has brought suffering into your life. I don't have that answer for you. I know God does. And maybe He won't reveal it to you straight away. But you ought to be thinking, God, I want to grow from this. I don't want to waste this. Help me not to waste this. That's the second prayer. Lord, you reign. The third prayer is, Lord, restore. Look at verse 20 down to verse 22. Verse 20 says, why do you always forget us? Why do you forsake us so long? Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may return, renew our days as of old. Now, perhaps this is the highest good that comes from suffering. Here it is. The best thing that can happen to you after and through and in your suffering is that God brings you to a place where you can pray, God, restore me to you. Bring me back to you. Helps us see here the biggest problem in the chapter. There it is. They're they're giving voice to that. Notice what they're not praying for. God, restore our city. God, restore our homes. God, restore the temple. God, restore our economy. Restore our livelihoods. They don't pray any of that. And all of those things had been taken from them. But the one thing they asked, God, restore us to yourself. We want you, God. That's a great prayer. That's a great prayer. They'd been running away from God to idols. Substitute saviors who'd left them with nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. Their false gods let them down. And God had sent prophet after prophet after prophet to call them back. Jeremiah's whole ministry, friends, is tied up in that. In that verse, verse 21. Telling the people to repent. Come back to God. And they didn't listen. So God gave them what they wanted. You want idols? You can have your idols. 
And now they're miserable. Friends, God loves you too much to let you worship idols. And so he will do whatever it takes to bring you to your senses so that you come back to him. I'm what you want. And he will use suffering to teach you that. By removing your idol. I don't know what your idol is. But if you're trusting in that instead of Jesus, and you won't let that go, he will pry it from your hand. That'll hurt. That'll hurt, friends. But friends, this is the value of suffering. God had brought them to utter desperation first, and then he brings them to himself. He's teaching them. I mean, mean, you've heard the, 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 the cliche. You only know God is all you need when God is all you've got. That's what he's teaching them. God, restore us to yourself. Notice, there's there's a lesson learned here. There's there's a lesson learned, verse 21, look at it again. Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may return. Renew our days as of old. They're asking God to do what only God can do. Do you see that? This is God's work. If we are to be restored to God, God is the one who must do that. Restore us to yourself, O Lord, so that we can be returned. So that we can return. They know that they don't have what it takes to fix it. They know the problem underneath the problem. They know that unless God came to them, they would never come to God. They would continue to run away from God. They would continue in their rebellion. But there's hope here. This is the hope for every sinner in this building and every sinner who's watching at home. This is our hope here. That God takes initiative and comes to us. That the shepherd leaves the sheep to go and find the runaway. That's our hope. God does the work. All our hymnody spells it out. We don't sing this hymn, and perhaps we should. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's commands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. Unless God does the saving, we're not going to be saved. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. There's desperation there. There's desperation, there's dependency upon God there. God must do this or it won't happen. Or perhaps another hymn which we'll sing a bit later, God willing. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Let me quote Phil Riken. Phil Riken, who says, The book of Lamentations ends with a prayer for restoration and renewal. Jeremiah understood that renewal is up to God. It depends on God's initiative. Regeneration always precedes repentance. That is a theologically dense, packed sentence. Basically, the only way you will repent and believe is if God gives you life. New birth comes and then you repent and believe or else it never happens. Regeneration always precedes repentance. Before God's people return, they must first be restored, which only God can do. And this is where their biggest problem is solved. God comes. God restores. God circumcises the heart. Only God can do that. So how does the book end? It ends with hope. 
Restore us, O Lord. Restore us to yourself. That's my hope. That's my only hope. That's your only hope that God would do that. But hold on, that's not where the book ends. The book ends in verse 22. Look at it. The book ends with this verse. So renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. Full stop, end of book. Wow. Is that not the most downer way to end a book? Unless you utterly rejected us and you're angry with us beyond measure. Bang. What in the world do you do with that? I'm told that actually when Lamentations is read, in synagogues, even in our day, when they read chapter 5, they leave out verse 22. And they repeat verse 21. How's that? It ends on such a downer. What in the world is going on here? Unless you have utterly rejected us. Here's what I think's happened. They are raising this unless as a possibility. As a possibility. Unless, unless you've God, maybe, maybe you've utterly rejected us. They bring that in for the sake of showing that you've never ever done that and you never will do that. They bring it up as a possibility in order to show that it's not a possibility. He's making an indirect argument for God to show mercy. An indirect argument. He's making an indirect argument for God to be faithful to His Word. Jeremiah knows Deuteronomy 30. I'll put that up for you and walk you through a couple of these verses. Jeremiah knows. This is, this is Moses writing centuries before Jeremiah. Moses writing. And God speaking through Moses. And when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and you return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and you obey His voice in all that I command you today, with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. And he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. Oh, let's go back one. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you. And from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. And you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep all his commandments that I command you today. God promised that would happen. If, if, you, if you return to me, then I'm going to fix it. I'm going to bring you out of Babylon and put you back in your land and restore you. God promised that. And so Jeremiah now is saying, God, restore us. Have mercy on us. Restore us. Unless you've cut us off forever. And God, we all know that you haven't cut us off forever. That's what he's saying. He cannot cut them off forever if they come to him in repentance. They know that God said that. And so he will give them mercy. Now Jesus makes a very similar promise, doesn't he? In John, in John 6. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. I will never cast out. Friends, does that help you tonight? 
Does it help you to know that if you come back, He will take you? He will never say no? This promise in John 6 was signed in blood. He will never go back on this. God will draw you to Jesus, and Jesus will receive you with open arms. I'll finish with a story. An old Scottish pastor, his name was John Brown of Haddington. This is the late uh, 18th century. This pastor went to speak to this dear older Christian lady who's on her deathbed. And perhaps he didn't do this in a very gentle way. Maybe you don't want your pastor doing this to you, so Michael, listen up. He says to this lady, listen, Janet, what would you say if after all that God has done for you, he should let you drop into hell? He's testing her assurance. She says this, even as he likes, if he does, he will lose more than I'll lose. Even as he likes, if he does, he'll lose more than I do. All that I'll lose is salvation in heaven. But if he drops me into hell, he'll lose his faithfulness. He'll lose the truth of his word. He'll lose the steadfastness of this promise that I will never cast you out. Do whatever he wants, he'll lose more than I will. That's assurance, friends. And that's where I think Lamentations leaves us, unless, well, yeah, restore us, Lord, restore us. Let's pray together. Lord, we take comfort in this that you are our Father, that you hold our tears in a bottle. That you know our pain. Look, Lord, that's where it started and then it spread. Lord, we could tell you the story and you already know the story and you invite us to come and tell you the story anyway. And so thank you that you're a father who loves us. And thank you that you're a father who reigns. You are sovereign and that our suffering is never pointless. Help us, help us to grow in our suffering, to learn from it, not to waste it. And thank you for the assurance that you will never go back on your word, that you will never break a promise. Thank you that if we're in Christ, we will stay there forever. And we cling to that. We cling to that and celebrate that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will sing together.